Greetings everybody, Q and Cubes 3 here, and now we're going to be taking a look at this integral in the complex world. This one's an absolute exquisite support to evaluate, quite a unique solution as well, so let's just jump straight into things here. At first I want to take a look at that numerator because it is quite messy and we can simplify it quite nicely, in particular that sine of sine of x. How on earth can we rewrite sine of sine of x? Well, whenever you have sine of something, you can always think about it as being e to the i, times that something on the inside, which in this case is sine of x, but you only take a look at its imaginary parts. So that just comes from all this formula there. We also have this e to the cosine of x factor out the front. And because that's just a real number, we can drag and drop it inside of that imaginary part operator without any problems. So we can rewrite the numerator as being the imaginary part of e to the cosine of x, which we bring in. And then we still also have e to the i times the sine of x. Now we can bring those two exponentials together and notice if we do so, we're just adding these two exponents together. But what exactly is cosine of x plus i times the sine of x? Well, that's just by Euler's formula once again e to the i times x. So in particular, this numerator simplifies to being the imaginary part of e to the e to the i x. So we have this funny power tower of e's and other things going on in there. And it turns out this is a much nicer function to work with in the complex plane than this absolute mess we had at the very beginning. So that motivates us to use the following function to integrate. We're going to let f of z be equal to e to the e to the i times z divided by z. So we're just replacing all the x's with z's. Um, also notice that there's going to be a pole at a z equals zero, which we might want to avoid. It's also worth mentioning though that with the original function at x equals zero, it's a removable singularity, but when we transition to the complex plane, it's a non-removable singularity, in particular it's a simple pole. So when we integrate this function, while we're not quite integrating the original function we had in the very beginning, what we're going to do is after we integrate, we're going to be taking the imaginary part of everything, because we know the imaginary part of this function over here is exactly the function we started off with. So which contour should we use? Well, we want to go from negative infinity to infinity, and we want to avoid the pole at z equals zero, so why not use a semicircular contour with an indent at z equals zero. So here we have the contour C, and notice along the real axis we're going from negative R to negative epsilon, and then epsilon to R, avoiding Z equals zero. And the idea is we're going to be taking the limit as epsilon approaches zero and R approaches infinity, so that on the real axis we recover our original interval of integration from negative infinity to infinity. So now let's write out a couple of integrals. We have the contour integral over C of our function, and we can decompose this integral into each of its separate parts. So first of all, we go from negative negative r to negative epsilon, and then we have epsilon to r. Then we have the integrals over those two gamma parts as well, so little gamma, and then integral over big gamma. Now notice that this integral over c, inside of this domain here, there's no poles or singularities whatsoever, it's completely analytic, which means if we use Cauchy's integral theorem, this integral just evaluates to zero. Okay, so let's take a look at evaluating each of these integrals on the right hand side now. First of all, we have the integral from negative r to negative epsilon plus the integral from epsilon to r. Let's take a look at what happens in the limit as epsilon approaches zero and r approaches infinity. Well, we're just gonna be going from negative infinity to zero and then from zero to infinity, but that's just overall going from negative infinity to positive infinity of our function e to the e to the i z divided by z dz. And if you want to be a bit more precise, this is technically the principal value, but we don't have to worry about that too much in this video. So we got the first two integrals sorted, it just evaluates to this integral here, which would help us recover our original integral i from the very beginning. So now let's take a look at the integrals over these gamma paths here. So we have this guy done, let's take a look at the integral over little gamma now of our function f of z. Now what exactly is a little gamma? It's a semicircle of radius epsilon centered at zero. So let's introduce a bit of a parameterization here. We're going to let z be equal to epsilon e to the i theta. So that defines a semicircle. And we're going to let theta run from, now we're going to go from negative epsilon to epsilon. So this is a bit of a funny way to do a parameterization, but we're gonna start at a pi and then run all the way back to zero. And we can also calculate the differential dz as well, using the chain rule that's just going to be i times epsilon e to the i theta, 
d theta. So plugging all of that in now, we're going to get the integral running from pi up to zero of, now we're going to substitute epsilon e to the i theta into this function, and that's going to give us e to the e to the i epsilon e to the i theta divided by epsilon e to the i theta, and then dz becomes i epsilon e to the i theta d theta. And you might notice the nice thing is epsilon e to the i theta will cancel out with epsilon e to the i theta here, leaving us with an i out the front. We can also bring a negative out because we're going to switch the bounds of integration. So negative i integral, then we have e to the e to the i epsilon e to the i theta. That's a lot of e's there. And then we still also have a d theta. So now we're stuck with this integral. And now you ask, well, how on earth do we even evaluate this type of integral here with this insane power tower? Well, really, we're not really going to integrate it directly because we want to take the limit as epsilon approaches zero of the integral over gamma of our function. And really what we'd like to do is we'd like to bring that limit inside of the integral somehow, because if we can do that, then we're left with e to the e to the i. Well, this epsilon, that's going to be zero. But if epsilon becomes zero, then we're going to get e to the zero up over here, which is one. And that just leaves us with a constant e on the inside. So we'd really like to be able to bring that to limit as epsilon approaches zero inside of the integral. Now, in order to do this properly, we need to use the dominated convergence theorem, which isn't too tricky to show in this case, because essentially what we need to do is show that this function here is bounded and the bounds for this function is integrable on this domain. So let's investigate that expression a little bit. At first, I want to split up that very top exponential using Euler's formula. So that's going to give us e to the e to the i epsilon cosine of theta. Now the second part of all this formula is i sine of theta, but because we're multiplying again by this i epsilon, that's going to give us an overall negative epsilon times the sine of theta. And if you want, you can split up this e as well across the negative sign. So that's going to give you e to the first part and then times e to the negative epsilon sine of theta. Now notice that sine of theta is always going to be positive when theta is on the interval of zero to pi. And epsilon is positive as well. So this whole entire thing here is positive and then we have a negative. So in fact, everything in this exponent here is going to be less than or equal to zero. And because of that, this whole factor here, e to the negative epsilon sine of theta, is going to be less than or equal to one. Now, how about for this other exponential factor here? Well, we can split it up even more using Euler's formula, but I don't really feel the need to do that. You can quite clearly see it's bounded because you have epsilon cosine of theta here, which is going to be some kind of real number. And then you have e to the i times some real number. So that whole entire thing there, it's modulus is going to be equal to one. So since all these parts here are bounded, e to anything bounded is of course still bounded because e is continuous. So you can argue that the modulus of this function here will definitely be bounded. Eddie can derive some precise bounds if he wants to, and those bounds are going to be finite. So since the absolute value of this function is bounded, we can use a dominated convergence theorem and drag that limit inside of the integral. And what's that going to give us? Well, it's going to give us negative i integral from zero to pi limit as epsilon approaches zero of e to the e to the i epsilon e to the i theta. And we can apply the limits directly to this e here because all these exponentiations are continuous functions. And what happens if epsilon approaches zero? Well, this whole part is going to go to zero. e to the zero, oh, that's just going to be equal to one in the very end, leaving us with just e raised to the first power, which is e. So overall, this is going to give us negative i integral from zero to pi of e d theta, but because e is a constant, we just multiply that constant by the length of this interval, which is pi. So overall, that's negative i times e times pi. That's a really cool result. You have all these three nice constants mixed into, yeah, I guess one expression here. So that's pretty cool. So that's going to be the value of the integral over this little gamma here. And now it's time for the final integral, which is the integral over the big gamma of our function f of z dz. 
Now, usually when we integrate over these big arcs here and we take the limit as r approaches infinity, we expect the integral to go to zero because what we have a z in the denominator here. But it turns out, this is something pretty cool about this integral, it's not going to go to zero, it's going to go to some other finite constants. And in order to show that, we can use the dominated convergence theorem once again. And here, we're going to make basically the same parameterization, but instead of epsilon, we're going to use r. So we're going to let z be r e to the i theta. Now theta, it's going to go from zero to pi, so the correct orientation now, because what we're going from the right hand side all the way around to the left hand side. And we can also get its differential as well. So we have dz is equal to i r e to the i theta d theta. So plugging all of that in, we get the integral from zero to pi of e to the e to the i r e to the i theta over r e to the i theta i times r e to the i theta d theta. And just like before, we have some cancellations going on. So over here and over here. And this is going to give us i integral from zero to pi of, yeah, we have basically really the, the same thing going on here. So e to the e i r e to the i theta d theta. Now we can use the dominated convergence theorem once again, and we can take a look back up this expression here, but instead of epsilon, we just imagine those are going to be r. Well, this right hand factor here, if we replace that with i, and we imagine r going to infinity, well, that doesn't really change anything because this whole factor here is still going to be less than or equal to one because the exponent is going to be negative. And if the first epsilon over here, if that was an r, well, that doesn't really change the fact that r times cosine of theta is a real number. So the first exponential factor, its modulus is still going to be one. So using dominated convergence theorem once again, because this whole function, it's still bounded. If r approaches infinity, we can bring the limit inside of the integral. So let's do that. Let's take a look at the limit as r approaches infinity of integral over gamma of f of z dz. That's going to be i times integral from zero to pi of the limit as r approaches infinity of e to the e to the i r e to the i theta. And then we have a d theta. Now, it might not be too clear what happens in the limit as r approaches infinity just by looking at this expression here. But remember, we rewrote that exact same thing up over here. So let's change that epsilon to an r now. What happens as r approaches infinity on this very last exponential factor here? Well, you're going to essentially get e to the negative infinity, but that's just going to make everything over here go to zero. And this first exponential factor, it's bounded, so it's not going to go to infinity or anything. So that overall means that this whole entire exponent at the very top that just goes to zero leaving us with well, e to the zero so in fact in the limit as r approaches infinity what we're going to get is i times the integral from zero to pi of e and we just said that whole entire exponent there that goes off to zero so this whole thing goes to zero that leaves us with e to the zero or just exactly a one d theta and that's just going to give us i times pi. So it turns out that this integral over big gamma evaluates to some finite constant, which is pretty cool. You don't really see that too often. So now it's time to put everything together and we're going to take a look at this integral equation we had at the very start of the video. First of all, we have zero being equal to well, these two integrals, but we found in the limits that they're just going to give us the integral from negative infinity to infinity of e to the e to the i z over z dz and then we have plus the integral over little gamma what exactly is that going to evaluate to well it's negative i e pi so let's put a negative i times e times pi and then we have the integral over the big gamma which in the limits gave us i times pi so we have plus i times pi here and now we just need to rearrange things a little bit so we have the integral from negative infinity to infinity of e to the e to the i z divided by z dz being equal to i times e times pi minus i times pi. But we can factor out the i and the pi there. So that leaves us with i times pi e minus 1. And now we're pretty much done because we know that our original integral i, we can get that by taking the imaginary part 
of this whole integral we have on the left hand side here. So the integral i that we want from the very start, well, what's the imaginary part of this expression here? Well, it's just going to be pi times e minus 1. And that's going to be the final answer. So it's a pretty cool answer. We have pi and e and then a negative 1 in there. So yeah, quite a beautiful result. And the complex analysis involved isn't too complex either. So hopefully you guys were able to follow along well. So that's all from me for the complex analysis part. Now it's back to my boy Maths505 to wrap up the video. That was an immaculate solution using contour integration, and I really enjoyed it. And before we proceed, remember to subscribe to Q&Q3 and me too. So my solution is based on real analytic methods, but there is some cheating involved here. And it's cheating in the sense that I'm going to employ something central to complex analysis itself and i'm talking about euler's formula where you have e to the i times some real number t being equal to the cosine of t plus i times the sine of t so yeah it is i am borrowing from complex analysis but what i'm borrowing is euler's formula and anything euler is beyond the divide between real men and complex men so yeah i think that this is common ground for this showdown between the two methods and that's why in my opinion complex analysis actually takes the win in this situation in terms of being a better tool here. Number one, because that contour integration was extremely cool. And number two, even if you don't want to use contour integration, you're going to have to use some basic complex analysis. So yeah, I'm definitely conceding the win to complex analysis, but the solution uh, using other than this real techniques, the solution using real techniques is extremely cool it is it's quite nice and i'm pretty sure you'll like it so here we go so just as my boy q and cube 3 did we're gonna transform the numerator into something um, more friendly looking at least um, we can write this because we have the sine of the sine of x we know that this is uh, the imaginary part of e to the i times sine of x. So that means we can write our integral i as being the integral from negative to positive infinity of e to the cosine of x times e to the i times sine of x, the imaginary part of it, that is, divided by x. And now using the laws of uh, the exponential functions, we can add up the exponents over here and we get e to the cosine of x plus e to the i times sine of x which again using Euler's formula can be written as e to the e to the i x divided by x integration with respect to x of course. Now I'm going to make use of the series expansion for the exponential function where we know that e to the x equals the sum over the non-negative integers k of x to the k divided by k factorial. Only in this case, I don't have e to the x, I have e to the e to the i x. So replacing the x by an e to the i x, and the same on the right hand side here, we can write this as the sum over the non-negative integers of e to the i k x divided by k factorial. Okay, that looks good. So that means we can write our integral as that from negative to positive infinity of the imaginary part of the sum over k of e to the i k x divided by k factorial. And all of this will be multiplied by a 1 over x term integration with respect to x, of course. And because the x over here, or the 1 over x term, is independent of k, you can slip it inside the sum. So you now have the integral from negative to positive infinity. And because the imaginary part of a sum of complex numbers equals the sum of the imaginary parts, of course, we can write this as the uh, integral from negative to positive infinity of the sum over k of e to the i k x divided by k factorial times x and the integration is being carried out with respect to x. Now 
can we actually switch up the order of the summation and the integration operators? Well, there are no problems regarding boundedness or convergence here because we have a complex exponential upstairs in the numerator and the imaginary part of it is the sine function. And yeah, complex exponentials are oscillatory functions after all. And downstairs we have an x term here and we have a k factorial. So yeah, there are no problems regarding the summation and the integration operators in terms of boundedness or convergence. So yes, we can perform the switch up. So we can write this as the sum over the non-negative integers k of the integral from negative to positive infinity of the imaginary part of e to the i k x divided by k factorial times x dx. And with respect to the integration, this k factorial is just a constant, so we can just pull it out here. So we have the sum over k, integral from negative to positive infinity, 1 over k factorial, uh, the imaginary part, the integrand is just the imaginary part of e to the i k x divided by x dx. And all of this is starting to get a lot more familiar. So what exactly was this imaginary part again? Well, this is equal to sine k x. So we have the sum over the non-negative integers of 1 by k factorial, uh, the integral from negative to positive infinity, sine of kx divided by x dx. Now, many of, you, many of you will want to just call this the Dirichlet integral and then replace it with a pi. Well, it is, Dirichlet, it is the Dirichlet integral, but there's one special case to consider here, and that is the case of k being equal to zero. Because for k equal to zero, we have one by zero factorial times the integral of sine of zero times x is just going to be zero, right? So we have the sine of zero by x dx. And so the integrand just collapses to zero. And so the entire integral here for this case is zero. And since you can add or subtract any number of zeros from a series, we can start our sum now at the index k equal to 1 instead. And this is a lot more uh, convenient because, well, it gives the right answer, of course. I actually missed this the first time I solved it. I actually solved this first using contour integration, and then I tried solving it using without contour integration, using the real techniques, of course, except for Euler's uh, Euler's formula, but remember that's that's common ground. That's common ground. Anyway, so when I solved it using contour integration, I got the result pi times e minus one. Whereas when I solved it using, uh, with, whereas I solved it using these techniques, uh, the first time I solved it, I got it wrong because I did not notice the k equal to zero, uh, the the k equal to zero case over there. So yeah. That's just one thing to take care of here. So we have the sum over the positive integers now of 1 by k factorial. And this is just the Dirichlet integral, which evaluates to pi, of course. So we have pi, which is just a constant multiple anyway. And now what exactly is this sum? Well, uh, the series expansion for e is the sum over the non-negative integers of 1 by k factorial. But if we consider the case for k equal to 0 separately, then we have 1 by 0 factorial, which is just 1 by 1 and 1, plus the sum over the positive integers case, which is the case we require. So that means this sum is e minus 1, which implies that our integral i equals pi times e minus 1, which is indeed a beautiful result. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much, Q and Cube 3. I really hope all of you enjoyed both these uh, techniques of solving this wonderful integral and deriving this beautiful result. And remember to like and subscribe. Subscribe to both of our channels. And thank you. See you next time.